praise your name this morning, Jesus. Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We raise all praise to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout for joy. Put your hands again. Raise a song.
done for me. Oh my God. Your blood has set me free. Jesus, my Lord, look, look what, what you've done for me. Hey, help me, somebody. I haven't been the same ever since the day. Since the day I the day I called your day. name, Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh. Look what you've look done. What you've done yeah. for me. Look what you've done for me. Look what you've done for me. Your blood has set me free. Your blood has set me free. Jesus, my Lord. Jesus, my Lord. Look what you've look done. What you've done for me. Hey, hey.
welcome this morning um, to our global communion. Well, it's an online service. And, um, well, I don't know any other greeting than Happy Groot Friday. <laughs> All right, then. We'll start off by taking a hymn, and the name of this hymn is Jesus Paid It All. And we'll sing this hymn and be back with the message. Jesus paid it all. All right. You can put the hymn up for us to sing now. Jesus 
Amen and amen. Welcome back. All right, so this morning we're having a communion service, and the way we are doing this is um, people will administer the communion within their families, and we'll see from Scripture that this is also a God-ordained way of administering the communion if we look at it in its historical context. So I'll start out from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll read it from verse 23 uh, to verse 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verses 23 um, to verse 32. Please, can you put up the scriptures right now? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to. Paul said this, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. Now, we'll see this as we go on, why Paul said, for I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The reason is, Paul was not physically present when Jesus Christ uh, did this with the 12 uh, disciples at that point. So he didn't get it by uh, human knowledge, he got what he was about to share by the revelation of the Spirit. So he said, For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And then the Bible says, after the same manner, also he took the cup. And when he had sobbed, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, if there is any day in which we should remember Jesus, it will be the day in which Jesus himself was crucified. For the time in which he did this was on this set day, which was the day of the Passover feast. We'll see that. And the most important event in not just the Christian calendar, but the human calendar, uh, the calendar of the entire humanity is actually this Easter period. Because when we say to 2021, what we are saying is 2,021 years after the death of Jesus. So this event marked the human calendar as the most significant event that happened in time. So time has been demarcated into two, all right, periods to speak. Before this event happened, and then after this event happened. So it's the most important, all right, date in the human calendar. So we go on here, and it says, do this in remembrance of me, all right? So let's go on First Corinthians 11. So, verse 26, it goes on and then says this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, Till he comes. You proclaim it, uh, you announce it, you reflect over it, and, and you meditate upon the essence of it. And he says you can do it as often as you really want to do it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, proclaim, announce the Lord's death till he comes. Verse 27. It says, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, it says, but let a man so examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And verse 29, it says, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
So we're going to get back into this. It says, for this cause many are weak, many are sickly among you, and many sleep. So we get back to that. But let me just trace where this is coming from in Scripture. In other words, Jesus himself spoke about this and or where he started this whole communion of it. In Luke chapter 22 from verse 8, it tells us about the season of the Passover. And so what happened was he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Uh, so Passover was uh, an ordinance that the nation of Israel kept at a particular time during the year. And it coincided with the date in which Jesus Christ himself was crucified because Jesus is our own Passover in the New Testament. Now we will see when we get to the Old Testament, which was a type and a shadow of what we are doing today, for Paul himself said clearly that Jesus, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep that feast. So there is a spiritual dimension to that feast. So Jesus told them, right, in Luke 22 verse 8, he said, Peter and John, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And then verse 9, the scripture tells us, and they said unto him, where will we go and prepare this? Verse 10, he tells us, he said, behold, when you enter into a city, you will meet a man there bearing a pitcher of water, follow him to his house where he enters in. Verse 11. The scripture said, and you shall say unto him, good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, where is thy guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. So verse 12, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. In other words, he will show you the upper room, get it ready for the Passover. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And then verse 14 it says, and when the hour was come, he sat down. Now, Jesus, picture this in your mind now. The place is prepared. Meditation is about building word pictures. So you picture that. He sits down with his 12 disciples. Let's go on. To keep the Passover, which was a Jewish ordinance. We'll see this. The Bible says, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 16, for I say unto you, I will not eat, I will not anymore eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus was saying, what we are doing here is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when it's fulfilled, then we will do something then. Verse 17, it says, and he took the cup and gave thanks. And he said, take. Now, this wasn't what you do in the Jewish Passover, all right? We'll see that it wasn't about taking a cup and then giving thanks and then take this and divide it among yourselves. And then the next thing, verse 18, he went on and said, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God is come. Now, verse 19, it tells us, And he took bread and gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. You do this in remembrance of me. And this is what Paul was speaking about, that the night in which he was betrayed, he took the cup and he took the bread, he broke the bread and said, This is my body that is broken for you, and took the cup, and talked about his blood that was shed for them. So let's read on here. And so he went on and said, Likewise also after the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament. So he started talking about the New Testament. This is not how they used to keep the Passover. We'll see how they kept the Passover. You will eat with their unleavened bread, dry herbs, bitter stuff. There's a meal that they prepare. It is not what he was talking about here. So this, all right, it was showing them something, a spiritual significance of that particular feast. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Verse 21, but behold, the hand of him that betrayed me 
is with me on the table. Now remember what Paul said. The night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. So the breaking of the bread was actually about the breaking of his body as a result of betrayal. Now, get put out your mind. In other words, betrayal of a trust invested in you causes a division, right, inside the body. Now, go to the next one. Put up the verse again. All right, let's see this. But behold, verse 21, it says, Behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on this table. Verse 22. And then he goes on and says, And truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined, but woe to that man by whom, it says, he is betrayed. And then next verse, And they began to inquire among themselves which of them should do this thing. And then verse 24, And there was also strife. Now strife also was there. Among them, which should be accounted greatest. In other words, strive to be the Lord, to be the most prominent, to be, have preeminence over every other person. And there was also strife among them. And he said, um, all right, next verse. And he said unto them, the king of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority over them are called benefactors. And then it says, but you shall, it shall not be so with you. He that is the greatest amongst you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. Now, this is very important. All right? And talked about whether he that sitteth or he that serveth. Very important. Uh, the reason is, Jesus, uh, Paul said, the reason why many are weak, sickly, and many fall asleep is because you don't properly discern the Lord's body. And when he was talking about discerning the Lord's body, it was what Jesus was saying there. He that will be the greatest among you must be servant. Strife has got to be taken out of your midst. There must be no sense there of betrayal within the body of Christ because a, what keeps us together is a blood covenant. And so when we come to the table of the Lord, there are certain things. And he said, you eat and drink in an unworthy manner, not discerning the Lord's body, understanding the significance, not of the bread there, but of the body of Christ upon this earth. We'll see this. No distinction between the body and the world. That is, you treat the Christian and the church just as any other institution, even though you are within. Now, people on the outside, it is fine, all right? But people on the inside who have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ must understand and treat his body, all right? So that the bread is not just something uh, symbolic, but you understand the spiritual significance of it. Now, so they did that on the Passover. Let's quickly go back to the beginning, what actually happened. So if we go to Exodus chapter 12, then I'll go back, I'll go back to 1 Corinthians and then explain a few things and we'll go to the communion table so that we do this in a worthy manner. All right? Exodus 12, year 1, this is where it all started. And so we've got to understand that the meal called the Passover wasn't what Jesus did when he brought out the cup and when he brought out the bread and broke it. Now, Exodus 12 here, so let me just say this here. The elements of communion are things that you should find inside your house. There is nothing really, you know, the bread doesn't have to be unleavened bread. Okay, it doesn't have to be a small white bread that is unleavened. It was the meal that was before them, and it took the bread. Now, of course, in that meal there, uh, what they had was unleavened bread because it was part of what they used, all right, in, in uh, uh, the Passover meal. But what I'm saying is, it's not necessary that it has to be that because it's about you not having that leaven 
of malice and strife. Uh, put up that scripture there. It says in, in 1 Corinthians, it says, let us keep the Passover, the feast of the Passover. Our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Let's do it without any form of malice on the inside or wickedness there. I believe it's 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 7. If W2 Media, please, could you find the scripture and put it up? All right. and do it. I'll just do it from here and read it out from here. So in 1 Corinthians here, it tells us chapter 5, it says verse 7, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So if a person has malice and wickedness in their heart towards their brother, and they are eating unleavened bread, they are doing it in an unworthy manner, not discerning the Lord's body. So when we speak about eating it, the unleavened bread, is talking about the state of your heart. That you come before the table of the Lord and understand the gravity of this and the state of your heart. That you understand about service and what brings about strife among people is when people want to have preeminence over others. The Bible say, talks about vain glory when you want what is called self-exaltation and you want to dominate other people, then strife comes in, in your heart. But if you are going to be the servant there, so the point is not the state of the physical bread you are eating, or partaking of, the point is the state of your heart and how you discern the Lord's body on the earth. And as we get into it and close, I'll say some strong things about this, particularly, all right, today to this generation, because there is not that sacredness of the Lord's body, the discerning, and we'll see the Greek word for discerning, all right, and, and you see what Paul was saying here. So quickly, let's look at Exodus chapter 12 here, verses 1 to 14. Exodus 12. So this is where it came from, and this is why Jesus called them together for the Passover. Exodus 12, 1 to 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And then verse 3, quickly. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So a lamb was to be taken for every house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls every man according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, all right, of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Verse 7. And they shall take off the blood and strike it on the two doorposts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So the blood was to be placed on the doorpost. The flesh was to be eaten. All right? They were to eat it. Now, next verse. 
and they shall eat the flesh in that night. So they were to eat the flesh, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat. So this meal here, which means roasted goat or sheep there, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs constituted the meal called the Passover that the nation of Israel used to celebrate every year with, and families would come ceremoniously to eat this. That's what Jesus was doing there, but he changed it. Verse 9, it says, Eat not of it raw or sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, with the pertinence thereof, and then verse 10, and you shall let nothing of it remain till morning. So eat everything, and that which remaineth it until morning shall be burnt with fire. Verse 11, it says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins gathered, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hands, and you shall eat it in haste, for it's the Lord's Passover. Now what did it mean? For I'll pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, in other words, not when you kill the lamb, but when I see the blood. So if the lamb was killed, and the blood was not applied to the doorpost, the angel of death could come in, even though the lamb was killed. In other words, Jesus was sacrificed for us, but it is not enough because he has died as a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. The people that get saved are those who apply, application, apply the blood to their doorposts. Because he didn't say, when you sacrifice the lamb, he said, when I see the blood, I shall pass over you. So anywhere the blood was not applied, that family, that house, could be considered as a hidden house, and the angel of death could go in. So it's imperative that not only, and you follow instructions with God, not only all right, was the lamb to be shed, the blood had to be applied, all right, so that they could be saved. Okay, so let's go back. It says, I will pass over and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So I was going to go and smite the land of Egypt, and he said, we don't know where you folks are living, all right, so this angel of death is coming, once he gets there, the only way we know this is a Jewish house is the blood, all right, is right there, applied. Even if an Egyptian got wind of what was going on and could access blood too and he applied it, his house would have been passed over, all right? Now, the eating of the flesh was for something else. And that eating of the Passover was for their health. So that when they came out, there was not one feeble man among them. But the blood was for their protection from the angel of death. So these were two things that God... Now, it's Good Friday. We shouldn't get too deep. So let me... All right. All right. Just share. We shouldn't start giving people... All right. Too much. One time I preached a Christmas message, somebody came and said, Pastor, your Christmas messages are too deep. This is Christmas. Let's celebrate Jesus. You are going too deep into why his body was in, all right? So I said, all right, we'll be preaching. So let's, but the body was to be eaten, and if we can get to this, and the blood was to be applied. Okay, so let's go on to the doppels. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast on the Lord, to the Lord, throughout your generations. You mu he told him, he said, you must keep this as a feast. So there was a feast of Passover where everybody went to Jerusalem and people went to keep that feast. He said, throughout your generation, the Jewish people are keeping the natural dimension of this feast in this season also, as we are keeping the spiritual dimension of it. 
They are eating this meal described while we shall be eating the blood and the body of Jesus. Now, let's go on here. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance. You see what he said? He said there is an ordinance you will use to keep it. It is this ordinance that Paul spoke about when he said, do this in remembrance. Now, let's go back to that scripture. No, put it back. What did Jesus say? Do this in what? Remembrance of me. All right? So let me imagine people are responding to me here. In remembrance of me. So, put that scripture again. Look at what it says here. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. In other words, in remembrance of what happened that your Passover was sacrificed and that's how you got out. You will keep it as a feast unto the Lord throughout your generation. You will keep it as a feast by an ordinance. There's something symbolic you will use to keep this feast. Next verse. It says, seven days shall you eat unleavened bread the first day. So they told them about their own feast. You cook this and all of this you will do. But Paul now went on and said, all right, so let's go back. 1 Corinthians 11 here uh, and verse 25. 1 Corinthians, so we see that Jesus uh, took it. 1 Corinthians 11, 25. Jesus took it, or let's start from verse 24. Jesus said, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. The night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And that's how his body was broken on the cross. This do in remembrance of me. Next verse, it says, after the same manner, which means with thanksgiving, not in an unworthy manner, but with thanksgiving, he took the cup. And when he had supped, he said, this cup, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. All right? Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Now, if you do something, it is saying, if you are not worthy to eat the bread, and you are not worthy to drink of the cup, don't do it. That, that's not what he's saying. These are two different things. If you eat in an unworthy manner, so let me just use an example. If you have, somebody buys a very expensive car, all right, okay, now, when we're young, and my parents would travel and they will buy clothes for us. So sometimes my mother will come into the room and you throw clothes everywhere and she says, you folks, you know how much it costs to, to buy these things. When we see you, the way you throw these things, and you consider the amount you spent in foreign exchange, all right, she wasn't saying that we were unworthy to wear the clothes. She was saying we were treating them in an unworthy way. These are two different things. You are not talking about whether the person is qualified to eat. You are talking about the way the person is eating of something they are qualified to. All right? So, what he's talking about is you do it in an un unworthily, which means, you know, somebody comes and... You look at it and say, do you know how much it costs? All right, do you know the price that was paid? I mean, we sang that him. Jesus paid it all. Now, I'll describe the price that Jesus paid. He said, you are eating and drinking this thing unworthily. Now, how are you eating and drinking unworthily? He said, you are not discerning the Lord's body. Let, put it back. Let's see this. Put it back quickly. Wherefore, also eateth this bread and drinketh of this cup unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood. Of the Lord. Verse 28. But let a man examine himself, which means your approach to this thing. And so let him eat. 
He didn't say don't eat. He said eat, but examine yourself. And drink of that cup. For he that drinketh and eateth unworthily, without showing reverence and gravity, eateth and drinketh damnation or condemnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, he's not saying you are not discerning the bread. He's saying you are not discerning God's body, the body of Christ. All right? You are not discerning it. The word discernment there means there is no distinction. You have placed no distinction between the body of Christ and the world. That's what he said. In other words, there is no distinction between the body of Christ and the world. Now, so we we'll say some strong things here. You have to have a distinction there between the body of Christ and the world. The way you go about things within the body of Christ is different from the way you go about things in the world. The way you handle so that you don't betray the body in your behavior. Because by doing that, you are betraying Jesus. It is his body. We agree that the body has its weaknesses, has its infirmities, but you don't betray the body of Christ as a collective institution. And you don't betray the body of Christ before the world as a collective institution. You protect the body of Christ. In other words, decisions that you're making and things you do, you should have the body, which means how will this thing uh, he says you are not discerning the Lord's body. For example, First John and says, examine yourself. Chapter 3 and verse 14. It says this. There's a distinction. First John 3, 14. We know we have passed, remember angel of death, from death to life because we love the brethren. We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother. So he was talking about a distinction there between the body and the world. Because God makes that distinction. If you look at it there, he says in 1 Corinthians there, 11, let's look at verse 36. All right, 1 Corinthians 11, you see there's a distinction. 1 Corinthians 11, all right, verse 34. Let's go to 34. Verse 34, quickly. Okay, verse 36. Um, sorry. Let's look at, uh, let me just get it out. So, he talks about how he deals with, all right? All right, First Corinthians 11, that's what I said, verse 32, sorry, verse 32. All right, let's start from verse 30. Now, for this cause, many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep. The word makes me physically weak. Your body physically are sick and die prematurely. All right? So what the body that they ate, the blood was to protect them from the angel of death. The body that they, the lamb they ate was for their body. For this cause, many. All right? Verse 31. For if we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So God chastens his people so that they are not condemned. So there is a distinction between. And if you read the letters of Paul, he places that distinction there. 
Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Galatians 6 and verse 10. Hear what it says. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially, so there's a distinction, unto them that are of the household of faith, especially. In other words, if it is in terms of your benevolence here, the body of Christ gets priority. All right? Priority. So, the truth about the matter is, for example, let's say during COVID pandemic, where people, you know, were in need of, of, of physical things, where there was a lockdown and palliatives. If a church decided they were going to do palliatives, the only way it will be acceptable in the eyes of God is that you first of all, every member of your church must have food on their table before you go and start saying you are feeding the world. If you go and start saying you are feeding the world without feeding every person inside first. Now, if you don't have the resources to do that, then that's it. But you cannot. It's just like, that's why the scripture says that a man who, 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 who will not take care of his own, all right, it tells us that that man has denied the faith and is worse. In other words, you see the body of Christ as that house, as your family. And that's the first thing. Now, after you have done that, you can now, a man won't provide for his own, especially those he has denied and is worse than an infidel. So there is a pattern there of discerning the Lord's body. As the Lord's body gets priority here, because we're body here. Okay. You see your brother sin a sin that be not unto death. You ask life for him. That you are discerning the Lord's body. You pray that life comes in. You understand the dangers of strife within a body. You discern the body. You understand that the death of Jesus was, was because of this idea that I must, and that's the same thing that was, all right, in Lucifer. I want to be like the Most High above the stars of God. So you discern the Lord's body. Finally, let me just say this, and this one is quite strong. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1 to 8, this is part of discerning the Lord's body. Now just hear what Paul said here. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 8. All right? There any of you having a matter against another, this is the same Corinthians, it's the same book. Go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. Verse 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world be, shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life. If then you have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it not so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. In other words, there is an issue between two brothers inside a church. And he says, you don't distinguish the body of Christ from the world. Look, God is a judge. God is not just, he's not just everything, everything, just let's show mercy. Or else people wouldn't learn things. You can't have mercy without judgment first. God, when you say you're merciful, it means something that should pertain to somebody person. Now, God is a judge, and he has his judicial system within the body. And what you have got to do is to follow the judicial system inside the body. In other words, what Paul is saying here is somebody offended somebody. The scripture says, take, go to meet that person and talk to that person about it. If this person says, then go and look for somebody inside the body, two or three. They go, which are like elders, people there, and call this person and warn this person and bring this person all right there. Now, what we'll do now is they don't even discern the Lord's body, which means that it's almost like 
matters happen in the church, you don't even think about telling anybody. You just say, let's go to social media and, and settle this matter on Twitter. That's not descending the Lord's body. It's not. All right? Then he says, if the entire church sits and says what you did is wrong, and they tell somebody, and that you have to make amends for what you are doing, and the person refuses, then he says, treat that person as a heathen. In other words, the blood covering over that person is removed. That person, that's what Paul was talking about. Paul didn't say that there's no judgment. He said that there's a process to it. The blood covering is removed. That's what he did to that brother. When he said that, look, you are doing this thing a little leaven, leaven the entire long, which means that in a very careless, braggadocious way, and you are destroying the body of Christ within that community. In other words, it's not just a flaw in a mistake. He was doing it without any regard for the body of Christ. Bringing the body of Christ in disrepute by his actions, and he continued blatantly to do it. So there's a way in which God himself dealt. He said, defraud not one another, brethren, for God is an avenger of such. It's in the Bible. So God has his judicial system within the body. And that's why inside the body, when we go to learn things, then we, we, we have institutions inside the body that will strengthen the body and protect. And it says, so God does chastisement to the individual such that that individual there is not condemned with the world. So as we go to the communion table this morning, I want you to examine yourself and take this thing with the worth that is associated, which means the body of Christ. And understand that, look, things, I can't sell within the body strife. I can't be in strife, all right, with any member of the body of Christ. I can't have my heart turned. I mean, there's nowhere the Bible says, even if you look at Paul's letters, where he talks about that the church is a perfect, in, the people that attend the church are perfect. The only letter where Paul did not correct an error was really to the church at Ephesus. Everywhere he, there were issues that he was responding to and dealing with. Right? But he said there is a blood covenant that holds the body of Christ together. And that has to be honored. All right? And when you go to the table, you honor that inside your heart. And in closing, let me just talk about the body. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 17. And I'll read something to you. All right? Matthew 18 and verse 17. And if you... Matthew 8, sorry. Matthew 8 and verse 17. All right, Matthew 8 and verse 17. That it might be fulfilled. Now let's go back to verse 16. Somebody got healed, okay? When evening was come, they brought unto him those that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that might be sick, that were sick. Verse 17, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, when did it take our infirmities, by our sicknesses there? For us, Gentiles, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of, his, of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. In verse 4, it says he has borne our griefs. It's our pains, our infirmities, and our sorrows there. So he carried it on the cross, and by his stripes we have been healed. First Peter 2.24 Peter quoted this and said, by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. He himself bore our sins on his body on the cross, and we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Now, I'll close by reading to you what the stripes on the body of Jesus meant, so you understand the intensity of what he did to remove when he took our infirmities on his body. 
Remember, they eat of his body for the health of their own being. And the blood is applied for protection from the angel of death. But you eat of his body for the health. So I get to the table of the Lord today. And to partake of this, release your faith for divine protection from external aggression. Anything you hear going on in the world, plague by night, arrows by day, Psalm 91, believe God that as you partake of this, release your faith. It is not the elements in themselves that have power. It is the revelation in your heart and you are using it as a point of contact to release your faith in God. So what happened? Why should you be healed? And as partake of that, he took our infirmities. And because he took our infirmities, he says everybody, everybody that was sick and everybody that was possessed with the devil, it was taken off. That it might be fulfilled. He took our infirmities. And it happened on the cross. And when we say by the stripes, we have a feeling that when Jesus was beaten, all right, that they just used, you know, a few whips. <laughs> that wasn't what happened. Now, let me read to you from Greek and Hebrew scholars on the word stripes. So, I go into my library to read to you from a Greek and a Hebrew, Greek and a Hebrew scholar. In fact, this, it means the word stripe comes from a word which is the mark of a blow or a bruise. It's not talking about many stripes. It's the mark, which means by the mark of the blow and the bruise on Jesus, you are healed. If Christ had been so scourged that the mark of each blow could be plainly have been seen on his back, then the rule of the Greek grammar would have demanded the use of another word, all right? The word used was the word molops. The word that will have been used, there were several stripes. So on him will have been molopsy and not the singular word, which meant bruise. It will have been bruises. The use of the singular here tells us as, a clear, as clearly as language can express it that our dear Savior's back had been so terribly scourged that no one blow could be possibly distinguished from another. Every spot on his back was so bruised and lacerated that it was just like one great bruise. Now, so you understand the nature of the bruise. Had there been one quarter inch of space between any of the two bruises, the Greek here must then have read molopsi and not molopi. All right? Which means molopsi and not molopi. The Jews had a law that no person should be given more than 40 stripes when flogged. But the Romans had no such law. So they often scourged their victim until he bled to death. But besides the scourging Christ on the back until his whole back was just one great bruise, the cruel Romans plucked out whiskers by its roots and spat upon him. Isaiah 56 describes this. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Just here, let us quote, all right, from the writings of a Greek scholar. Victims condemned to the cross first underwent the hideous torture of the scourge, and this was immediately inflicted on Jesus. He was now seized by some soldiers standing near, and being stripped to the waist, and bound in a stooping posture, his hands behind his back to a post or a block near the tribu tribunal, he was then beaten at the pleasure of the soldiers. 
with knots of rope or plated leathern tongs, armed at the ends with acorn sharp drops of lead or sharp pointed bones. In many cases, not only was the back of the person scourged, cut open in all directions, but even the eyes, the face, the breasts were torn and the teeth not seldom knocked out. Under the fury of the countless stripes, the victim sometimes sank amid screams, convulsive leaps, distortions into senseless heap. Sometimes they died on the spot. Sometimes they were taken away, an unrecognizable mass of bleeding flesh, to find a deliverance only in death from the inflammation and fever, sickness and shame. The scourging of Jesus was of the severest, for the soldiers only too gladly vented on any Jew the grudge that they bore on that nation, the grudge they bore that nation, and they would, doubtless, try if they could to force out the confession which his silence denied the governor. In other words, if Jesus had given a sound when he was being beaten, he would have broken because he had to be dumb. With that flogging and torture, he kept quiet. Others who were screaming, he had to be silent. Besides, he was to be crucified. The harder the scourging, the less life there will be left to detain them afterwards on guard at the cross. Which means you've got to beat the person severely so by the time you hang him, he dies quickly so you can go home. Eusebius, the whole early church historian, describes a Roman scourging of some martyrs' thoughts. All around were horrified to see, so th torn with the scourges that their veins were laid bare, their inner muscles and sinews, and every there, sorry, and even their very bowels were exposed. Reader, now you understand why Peter asserts with Isaiah, by his bruise, not bruises, you are healed. Referring, as we have clearly proven, from the use of the verb healed to bodily healing. In other words, the only use of the word healing in the New Testament and in Scripture is for bodily healing only. Much of the precious blood was doubtless shed while receiving that awful bruise for a physical healing. But the rest of his precious blood was reserved to be shed on the cross for our sins. Yes, Peter here, in 1 Peter 2.24, clearly teaches that Christ not only suffered, bled, and died for our sins, but also for our physical body. Again, Paul, as well as Isaiah and Peter, is a witness to this same great fact that bodily healing is in the atonement. For in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. You are not of your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That is, not just the spirit but the body also belongs to God. So as we go to the table this morning, we will apply the blood there. As they put the blood on the doorpost in a confession of faith concerning the blood of Jesus, all right, over every family will do that confession of faith. And then we will sing about the blood of Jesus while you reflect in your heart there and make that adjustment that I will treat the body of Christ. All right, treat the body of Christ. Place the distinction between the body of Christ and the world. The body of Christ and the world. And, 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 and place that distinction, put it there, that deal with it in God's way. I mean, Jude told us that the archangel Michael, coming against even Lucifer, did not say with his own mouth, the Lord rebuke, um, did not say, I rebuke thee. Did not bring a railing accusation against him when 
Lucifer was accusing. But he said, the Lord rebuked thee. In other words, there is a way in which God gets his result. And God can be severe about it, but he gets it in his way, all right, among his own body there. And that's what we should seek and not just be somebody who says we attend church without understanding the blood covenant that has brought the body together as members one of another. Now we'll take this confession, can put it up of the blood so everybody can see this. And you confess this over your entire family. This confession here is the direct application of the blood while the instrumentalist, please get ready. We're going to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ now. All right, so be set for that. All right. We're going to take this confession here of the blood of Jesus and this applying to your doorposts or in your homes. Make this declaration and confession over your family. This is the application of the blood to your own doorpost here. All right, as you are within your doors there and you apply it. And then we go to the table there and you receive divine healing into your body. So this is for emancipation and deliverance and then that is for healing. Let's take the confession. One, to go. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare that I have come on the grounds of the blood of Jesus. Jesus was wounded for all my mistakes. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. I therefore declare Jesus Christ as my Lord, who shed his blood for the remission of all my mistakes. I declare into the earth this day that the blood of Jesus speaks powerful things concerning me and my family. I agree with what the blood is saying. I give voice to it in the name of Jesus. I declare to all forces of darkness in the name of Jesus Christ that through the blood of Jesus, my family and I have been redeemed. The ransom has been paid in full for our lives. We have been bought out of the influence of darkness. We have been bought out of the influence of wickedness in men by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross instead of me and took my place in suffering for my mistake. The price cannot be paid twice. My family and I are completely delivered out of Satan's hands and your verbal accusations, Satan, are rendered inoperative in our lives for we are under Jesus Christ. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified. Through the blood of Jesus, my family and I are acquitted and pronounced not guilty. We acknowledge you, Jesus, as my, our advocate, and say we may have spoken words that can be used against us in the courts of heaven by our adversary. We may have conducted ourselves in ways that has opened up the door for legitimate pronouncements to be made by people we hurt. And words may have been weaponized against us to cause damage and to hold us down. But we acknowledge that through your sacrifice, Jesus, the curse has been broken. We are set free from the effect of these things. I declare to you, Jesus, you are our advocate. You plead our cases on the grounds of your blood shed. And you have won every case. And we are set free in the name of Jesus and victorious in every battle. We therefore separate, we, we are therefore separate from the influence and the consequence 
of any negative words spoken by us concerning our lives or spoken by others into our lives. Every imagination or word spoken in secret against our progress is nullified. We reverse its effect this moment and it turns out for our progress. I speak to any demon or demons that may have gained entrance into any part of my family or life to hold us down by reason of words we may have spoken or words that others have spoken to control that aspect of our lives. We bring you under divine judgment. I say for as much as we, the members of my family, are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus took part of the same, destroyed you, Satan, that had the power of death, and has set my entire family at liberty. I expel you out of our lives in the name of Jesus. I cast you out of all my family's affairs, and I release angels this moment to minister to every single member of my family for growth, reproduction, protection, total health, prosperity, favor with men, and our supernatural rise in the name of Jesus. Anything that has been said into my family by the wrongdoing of the head of the family or previous heads of the family through which a door may have been opened to make a pronouncement into my family, I declare this moment as the priest in this family that the effect of these words are broken over my family by the sacrifice of Jesus and my entire family is set free in the name of Jesus Christ. I stand on the blood of Jesus and I renounce my rights to afflict any person who has offended me with words that will hurt or damage their lives. I forgive and release them in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare in the name of Jesus, this is my judgment concerning them. Those who have desired to swallow me up with their words according to the law of scripture, they are very far away from me now, and their words and imaginations have no effect on my life in the name of Jesus Christ. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over in spite of their presence, and I make satisfactory unhindered progress in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's just take this song and hymn, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ, and then we'll be back to administer the communion. Amen. Nothing but the blood of 
of biscuit you have, put it there. Even if it's water, it doesn't have to be colored. All right. Important thing is the state of your heart and whatever you have in your hands. Father, as you come before the table of the Lord Jesus, in the realm of the Spirit, he's seated with us right here. As we partake of his body and drink of his blood. We do this in honor of the sacrifice of Jesus, your lamb, that shed his blood and his body was bruised for our healing. His blood was shed for our cleansing, forgiveness, and protection. We release our faith this moment. Release it on the platform of the word we have just heard. And mix our faith with that word. That people under the sound of my voice, as they partake of your body this morning, afternoon or evening, wherever they are all over the world, that your healing power, the same that flows through Jesus, will permeate every cell within their body, drive out any demonic spirit, and bring wholeness from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. They will be healed completely and have your strength within their body. As we partake of the blood also, Lord, complete cleansing, 
wherever mistakes have been made, completely purged, that those things cannot be used by the accuser of the brethren against them on this earth again. We honor your body, we honor your blood. Without the shedding of your blood and the sacrifice of your body, we will be nowhere. This is all. This is what you gave to humanity, your very life. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. You can take up the bread and break and partake of it this moment in the name of Jesus. Same manner, with thanksgiving for the blood and partake of it. Lord, we worship you. Thank you for every single person that has participated in this service. Wherever they are, in their homes, wherever they are, let an eternal seal be placed upon what has happened here. That the fruit of divine protection and healing rest upon their lives forever in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Thank you. You can see several people are online watching from various parts. Um, just one announcement on Sunday. All right, in our morning services will continue. In all, the centers are now 12 centers. Um, on Easter morning, um, that Sunday, we will be um, opening the at the Palms, that's Genesis Cinemas at the Palms, which is, I think, is at Oni Road, the Palms. That's what we call shop right in the Palms Mall. They are at Genesis Cinema. You live around that area, all right, Victoria Island, all that area. You can go in there. Um, a very sound lead pastor will be there and we'll have a wonderful um, Easter service. The service there will be at 7.45 a.m. and also at Abule Egba. All right, we'll put it up. I think the mall is called the Herald Mall, if I'm correct. The Herald Mall in Abule Egba. Um, it's a very, very beautiful place. Um, Cinema House, very, very beautiful place where we'll be opening services. In all the other 10 centers, there'll be two services tomorrow morning, two services in all the other centers, that's um, Igomo, Yaba, uh, the Leki Center, Songo Tedo, Maryland, Isolo, Igondo, um, Ikeja, Ikorudum, and uh, one more, Festac. Thank you. All right? Festac. So in those 12 centers, we will be having services. The two centers at the Palms and also at Abuelek by 7.45 a.m. God bless you all and have a wonderful um, Easter celebration. Don't forget 5 o'clock, I almost forgot this, on Sunday right here at Igomo we'll be having a worship all right, session, a festival there to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll have Pastor Nathan Elbasi, we'll have Minister Duncio Yenko, we'll have physically here, and we'll have uh, virtually coming up live, will be Don Wen and Phil, all right, Thompson, and he will be singing, God has rescued, all right, my life. All right, then. God bless you all. Thank you for watching, all right, and see you on Sunday.